This might seem like a cliche, but this election is truly a battle for America's soul. So no matter whether it's mail-in, drop-off, or in-person, we need every single voter showing up to the polls. November 3rd is not just about getting rid of Donald Trump. Yeah, a move that is way past due. But it's about what this country will represent and who it is that will represent you. He asks, what do we have to lose? A question that has been answered time and time again. As his lack of leadership on the coronavirus has contributed to the deaths of hundreds of thousands of our loved ones and friends. There has to be a change of leadership. But the presidency is not where our focus should only be. We need a Senate majority in control of the House so legislation can be crafted that actually benefits people like you and me. No more tax cuts for the wealthy, enabling corruption or ignoring bills that speak to what we, the people, need. There might be two parties, but only one with a platform that's poised to actually lead. One party relies on fear, scaring their base into believing the America they know and love is somehow going away. When the country I know and love is currently being destroyed by those in power today. They have lied, schemed, colluded, conspired, and done damage that we, the people, need to collectively repair. And no, this president didn't divide us, but he's actively tried to make worse what was already there. He takes issues like immigration, police brutality, peaceful protests, and contorts them to a narrative that just doesn't exist. And his party has fallen in line, giving no comment, instead of condemning his grievances and hissy fits. He takes issues like social activism and turns them inside out just to get his base riled up and mad. When the fact is, whether we stand or kneel, we are all still moved by the flag. This was a country founded on protest. So the idea to fight back against oppression and tyranny just runs through us. That's why whenever you think of an excuse to not make it to the polls this fall, please remember the great John Lewis. People have fought and died, been beaten, bloodied, and bruised so you can handle being in line for a few hours. And I call on this administration to stop foreign interference. This decision should only be ours. I am looking to cast my vote for a party that will bring back a thriving middle class and lift up the poor. All this president does is play golf, so when it comes to his tenure in office, it makes sense that we would end it at four. We the people deserve more than an incompetent, heartless, dishonest administration that has completely run amok. And they are like kleptomaniacs with amnesia because they keep forgetting everything they've taken from us. I don't have enough time to condemn all that Donald Trump has done, but we have an opportunity to repair what has been broken through each and every vote, every single citizen, one by one. I am waiting for that blue wave to come. I can hear it in the distance and it's saying, let's build back better while the president would rather sow discord and disinformation, attacking the men and women who deliver our paychecks and letters. All he cares about is himself, his bank account, and anything he doesn't agree with is considered fake news. Racism, xenophobia, and an abdication of presidential responsibility aren't fake. Those are really his views. Retweets of white supremacists, conspiracy theories, divisive rhetoric, and fact-free press conferences have gone on day after day. Our country, our nation, our union, our democracy, our America simply can't go on this way. So if you're sick of what you've been seeing, hearing, and living for the past four years, then let's just vote them out. And if you won't accept the results, that's okay. We'll beat them by five million this time and leave no doubt. Good evening, everyone. I am Yvette Lewis, the chair of the Maryland Democratic Party, and welcome. I don't know about you, but I thought that was powerful. So let me begin by thanking Anthony Relaford for the uh, inspirational video entitled, What's at Stake? Um, I think that all of us can uh, re react and reflect upon what he said. And I hope that that was the perfect opening to the evening and the kind of discussion that we all hope to have. I'd like to thank our incredible panelists, that have joined us this evening. I am particularly excited about this conversation because I think it's one that's necessary and it's one that I hope we all will benefit from. We're having this conversation at a time where Americans are seeing the importance of police reform every single day. There is an historic effort to address the issues of systemic racism and police brutality, issues that will not be resolved until we start having tough conversations. And tonight, 
we are going to have that conversation. It's my hope that we can discuss the failings in our police and justice system and what we can do to overcome these failings. I also hope we will come out of tonight with a deeper understanding and a renewed purpose. But please understand, this is the beginning of the conversation and it will continue. This discussion also comes as we mourn the extraordinary Ruth Bader Ginsburg and face the threat of a 6-3 conservative Supreme Court, a court that would strike down police and criminal justice reform before it even gets started, before it even happens. If Donald Trump is allowed to appoint another justice, civil rights, health care, and the environment will all be under siege. I say this because there are actions that we can take and I hope each and every one of you who is watching tonight will take that action and you will vote as soon as you can and sign up to volunteer on our website, mddems.org. Together, we can win this fight. We will be making calls into swing states. We will be making calls into Maryland and I hope that all of you will commit to joining us. You should also know that your state party staff and team, me included, we'll be making these calls. We will be making calls every Saturday in October. We've already started making calls. We made calls last Saturday and the Saturday before. We have another phone bank scheduled for this Thursday night. And I think that if we're going to ask you to talk the talk, we have to talk the talk and walk the walk. So your state party team is invested in this and we're not asking you to do anything that we are not doing ourselves. So please join us. So now, I'd like to introduce our fantastic panel, and then we're going to turn it over to our wonderful moderator who is joining us again. Um, and I'm delighted, thank you, Senator Washington. I will tell everyone how wonderful you are, but let me take this moment to thank you because you've been with us at, since the beginning and um, our panels are getting better and better and you have been an incredible asset, so thank you. Thank you. Retired police captain, Sonia Pruitt, began her law enforcement career as an officer with the Montgomery County Police Department in Maryland. In her nearly 30 years on the force, she has served in many different roles, including as Deputy Director of the Internal Affairs Division and Administrative Lieutenant for the Office of the Chief of Police. In 2019, she was the first Black woman in Montgomery County history to be promoted to police captain. Pruitt is the past president of the Coalition of Black Police Officers in Montgomery County and past chairperson of the National Black Police Association. She is an adjunct professor of criminal justice administration at Montgomery College and teaches courses including introduction to policing, criminal investigation, and police organization and administration. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Dr. Rayshawn Ray is a professor of sociology and executive director of the Lab for Applied Social Science Research at the University of Maryland College Park. He is currently a David M. Rubenstein Fellow at the Brookings, Brookings Institution, a co-editor of Contexts Magazine, Sociology for the Public. He also serves on the National Advisory Committee for the RWJF Health Policy Research Scholars Program. Dr. Ray's research addresses the mechanisms that manufacture and maintain racial and social inequality with a particular focus on police civilian relations and men's treatment of women. He has published over 50 books, articles, and book chapters and 20 op-eds. Thank you so much for being with us tonight. Dr. Otis Johnson Jr. is a professor in the Department of Sociology and Education, founding director of the Institute in Critical Quantitative Computational and Mixed Methodologies, an Associate Director of the Center for the Study of Race, Ethnicity, and Equity in Washington University at Washington University in St. Louis. Prior to his current appointments, Dr. Chair Johnson chaired the African American Studies Department at the University of Maryland. He is currently the principal investigator of the fatal interactions with police study, which has generated a national data file of police homicides and three NSF funded studies that examine how strategies to maintain law and order in neighborhoods and schools impact the representation of race gender groups within the school to prison and STEM pipelines. Welcome Dr. Johnson, we're delighted to have you with us. And our moderator, Senator Mary Washington, has spent over 20 years working for Maryland's 43rd, 43rd district as a legislator, advocate and student of public policy. In 2010, she became the first openly LGBTQ African-American elected official in Maryland and only the second such state legislator in the country. 
Since then, she has dedicated herself to fighting the, for affordable access to water, protecting families at risk of losing their homes, making sure Baltimore City Schools get the funding they deserve, and helping unaccompanied homeless youth get support they need. She currently serves as Senate Chair of the Joint Committee on Children, Youth, and Families, Senate Co-Chair of the Joint Committee on Ending Homelessness, as a member of the Education, Health, and Environmental Affairs Committee. Senator Washington is a member of Women Legislators of Maryland, the Legislative Black Caucus of Maryland, and an associate member of the Latino Legislative Caucus. Thank you all so much for joining us. I could not be more thrilled to have you here. And now I'm going to turn it over to Senator Washington. Thank you. Uh, good evening, good evening, everyone. And thank you so much for being here. Um, I, I, I wanna thank uh, Chairwoman Lewis for uh, imagining uh, this series. Uh, uh, this is our, our, we've had more than one, we've had multiple series um, over the course of the summer uh, to address and talk about Black Lives Matter and talk about and have these tough questions um, and, and tough discussions. Um, hello, I'm Senator Mary Washington of the 43rd Legislative District in Baltimore, Maryland. I'm going to be your moderator to, for tonight's discussion and I hope to bring you some thought perspective, uh, thought provoking perspectives. And I'm really excited uh, because uh, we have some really very special guests. And as was pointed out in the introduction of fellow sociologists like myself. <laughs> um, and so we, uh, in the, we've had legislators discussing um, we've had many of folks who are working on the ground as advocates discussing uh, these issues, um, but, but tonight we're taking a, a step back, both uh, people who are experiencing and working on the ground, um, but also folks that are thinking about uh, sociologically uh, from a policy perspective. But first, uh, we're gonna have some logistics. This is happening as a Zoom webinar. It's being live streamed on the Democratic Party's Facebook page where it can be viewed after the panel has been completed. Uh, within a Zoom webinar format, there are going to be some folks who are attendees uh, who you won't be able to see, but we'll be able to submit questions uh, in the chat and question, for, uh, question and answer format. Um, we have digital associates that are gonna review uh, questions on faith, uh, Facebook uh, and curate some questions during our question and answer period. Uh, our panel discussion is going to start in about a minute. It's gonna last about 45, 45 minutes. Uh, each panelist is going to give a, an initial one minute intro about why you're here. Um, and then uh, all of you are going to uh, be here for the entire time. We're going to have a number of questions uh, for each panelist. Um, we like to have a discussion. So um, with some questions, every panelist is going to answer. Others are just going to be targeted to a particular uh, panelist because of their particular expertise. Um, then we're going to open it up to you. And so that's where you can uh, provide questions and answers in the chat um, or also again on Facebook. Uh, and that'll start, uh, we'll do that for about 25 minutes and then we'll have a closing. Uh, but again, I just would like to start if we could start with Captain Pruitt, um, tell us um, a little bit more about yourself and, and why you're here today. Hi, thank you, ma'am. It's good to see everyone. Uh, so I spent 28 years in law enforcement. I had planned on spending a little bit more, but COVID hit and I had a reimagining of my own life and what it is that I am doing to serve the people. So for those 28 years, I spread myself out amongst all of, of many of the departments of the, of the police department, trying to gain knowledge of, of how police departments work and policy and budget and all of those things. And I realized uh, this spring that I probably had attained quite a bit of knowledge in that besides my teaching at Montgomery College, that this was a time for me to step out and do the one thing that I had committed for, for myself and to the people, which was to serve by education. And so that is why I'm here tonight. I know people have a lot of questions about law enforcement and I'm hoping that I can add to that conversation in a progressive and productive way. Thank you, thank you. Dr. Johnson. Good evening, everyone. Um, and Senator Washington, thank you so much for um, the invitation and good evening to um, Captain Pruitt and Dr. Ray. Um, I am serving in multiple capacities at Washington University in St. Louis, but 
primary among them is my involvement in several research projects that speak to a lot of the challenges that we're facing daily when it comes to policing in Black communities. Um, I'm the principal investigator of the Fatal Interactions with Police Study, which um, uh, generated one of the earliest national probability samples of police-related homicide and understanding how those uh, homicides related to the place of residency and also race. Then I'm also the principal investigator of a number of National Science Foundation awards that uh, look into social control within schools. And when we say social control, we're really talking about how schools establish order and, um, and how they treat kids with respect to discipline and punishment. So one of the primary things that um, I hope we get to um, that's related to policing, perhaps tangentially so, but nonetheless important, and that is the school to prison pipeline. Uh, which is one of the, the, the ways in which we see the carceral apparatus of the nation actually impacting our young kids. Uh, and then lastly, as a practitioner, I am on a school board and daily am in interacting with our youth and trying to grapple with them um, um, and, and get down there in the trenches as they seek to understand what's going on in the US politically, but also in terms of policing and the people that they see daily within their school and neighborhood settings. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Johnson. And Dr. Ray. Well, Senator Washington, it is a pleasure to be here with you this evening, as well as with Captain Pruitt and Dr. Johnson as well. So I direct the Lab for Applied Social Science Research at the University of Maryland. And for the past several years, we've conducted a lot of research on law enforcement. Um, some of the most innovative and cutting edge research because we developed a virtual reality decision making program that police officers go through. And we have some of the best research that is able to examine implicit attitudes, explicit attitudes, policing behavior, and their physiology. So that's a long way of saying that we can measure everything from implicit bias to what officers consciously think to what they do and also what they feel. And I mean, there are a series of things that we've discovered that my colleagues and I have been working on over the years. In particular, we find that officers do hold anti-Black bias. That is something that is definitely prevalent. And even though this, this exists in the general population, most people in the general population do not have a license to kill. So that bias often can come out in disparities we see. And we know from the work of Dr. Johnson and others that Black people are 3.5 times more likely to be killed by police when they're not attacking or have a weapon. We've then taken that work and we've done implicit bias trainings with thousands of police officers. We've had hundreds go through our virtual reality program throughout the country. One of the other interesting things that we found is that the race of the officer really doesn't matter all that much. So there's a broader narrative that exists that white officers are primarily doing this to, to black people or black men in particular. But we find that when it comes to bias that it exists regardless of the race or gender um, of the officer. I've been studying policing for close to a decade and how it came about was essentially I found an Ahmaud Arbery effect. Mm -hmm. Ahmaud Arbery obviously as people know in Georgia, he was shot and killed in what many people consider to be a hate crime as he was literally chased as if he was a runaway slave through a neighborhood. And a decade ago when I was at UC Berkeley, I was examining physical activity and I found that black men particularly middle-class black men were significantly less likely to be physically active in predominantly white neighborhoods. And that had to do with the level of policing that they experienced in those particular neighborhoods, the ways in which neighbors would call the police on them, would profile them, would engage in, in various types of behavior. And in addition to Ahmaud Arbery, we've seen a lot of imagery on social media that definitely bears out in the research that we've done. At the Brookings Institution, I've aimed to scale this work up and have a larger policy impact. In fact, today, I don't know if Captain Pruitt was gonna say it, but we were on something earlier today actually testifying before the Maryland State Legislature on a, on a series of bills um, that was going before the Judicial Committee in the, in the State Senate. But that's the type of impact that can really make a difference in terms of using research to help policymakers make better decisions so that civilians can get home safely and that we don't see those racial disparities and then also their officers can get home safely and that they can have an enjoyable experience at work and not have to deal with 
um, some of the internal issues that I'm sure we'll hear from Captain Pruitt about the issues of what it means to be a law enforcement officer and be black and blue. And that, that is a great transition to uh, kicking off our first set of questions. Um, and as you can see, I hope, I hope those of you on Facebook and, and uh, with us in Zoom and who may be listening uh, on the phone is that this conversation is really helping us talk, uh, use data and information, um, empirical data, observations, measurements, uh, so-called objective measures to really talk about a, a, a fundamentally uh, subjective experience that black and brown Americans and Marylanders have. So in that context, and we're gonna lay a foundation uh, for our conversation um, that we're talking about our Marylanders um, in the context of Black Lives Matter movement. And you mentioned uh, uh, Ahmaud Aubrey, uh, Freddie Gray, Sandra Bland five years ago, and George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, um, sort of riffing off of our spoken word video by uh, Mr. Relaford, what is at stake? Um, so uh, I guess we could start, I'd start with uh, Captain Pruitt. Okay, so what's at stake um, from my vantage point is the lives of a of many people, you know, our, our ancestors. I like to talk about things from a historical standpoint. And in this country, we have not thrived yet. We are looking to be the thrive to thrive, to be the thrivers, to be thriving. And um, there are these things, the systemic racism and institutional racism that stands in our way. And I always call the um, call law enforcement the enforcement arm of systemic racism. That was, that's what makes it easy for uh, people to call the police on black people just going about the normal uh, living of life. Uh, so it's very deeply entrenched, uh, this, this, uh, this systemic piece in, into police culture. Um, so what's at stake is that uh, we have a lot of work to do and uh, that makes us in danger. That puts us in danger of uh, round and black people in danger. Uh, my sons, uh, anyone else who has uh, young, young people. And uh, I, if I can't find my words, it's because I'm really passionate about this. Um, mm -hmm. When you spend 28 years in the police department and you can tell by how you are treated as an officer and how your, your sisters and brothers are treated on the inside, then you know there is nothing but proof that is solid proof for me that when you go out in the street, this is how you treat people. And so when we see people who are dying at an extraordinary rate compared to other uh, categories of people in this country, because you know everybody has cell phone video, if black people are dying, why aren't we seeing the video of white people dying? I mean, that's pretty easy to, you know, to figure out. And if we are seeing this and, it's, and we're going about our business as normal, you know, we, you know, like Dr. Ray said today, we testified and there are people who are stuck um, on the way that we have been doing things. And you know, that creates insanity, right? Mm -hmm. We're not moving. And then there are people who do not want to move. And when I say there are people, I'm talking about leaders, police leaders who do not want to move from where we are right now. And so what is at stake is uh, our dignity, our respect, and our lives. And so I'm, I'm so happy to be a part of this conversation. I would like to hear what Dr. Johnson and Dr. Ray have to say about that. I lo love it, love it. We're all moderating our panel together. <laughs> Dr. Ray, <laughs> Dr. Dr. Ray uh, give us some, again, this is a, a great kickoff. Give us the, and, and again, reminding us that in, this is in the context of Black Lives Matter and certainly how it was constructed um, pre-COVID, post-COVID, how it was constructed 2015 and prior and how we are today. Can, can you make that connection with, you know, from your perspective, what, what is this Black Lives Matter and what's at stake? Yeah, I, I think what's at stake is a potential ending to a democratic experiment. So the United States supposedly is supposed to be a, a democracy. And what we're seeing right now, and obviously to a lot of black people in this country, a lot of immigrants in this country, to a lot of other people who are marginalized, I call it a democratic experiment. Coining this term from uh, General John Allen, who's the president of Brookings Institution, who talks about we've never really actualized it. In science, we talk about experiments. These are things that we test out. We try them. We try to figure out if they're going to work. 
And we're at a moment where this democratic experiment to be fair and equitable is something that the United States has failed at for 401 years. And I say that in the sense of when uh, black people from Africa were first brought to the American shore. And we are on the verge to be realistic about it of a true dictatorship. When we look at the things that Trump says, he is not only playing straight out of a Southern strategy or a law and order strategy from Richard Nixon, but he is also playing straight out of Adolf Hitler's strategy. Mm -hmm. When I was in graduate school, I studied and taught at the University of Mannheim in Germany. I studied Nazism a lot. I studied what happened with the Holocaust. I studied how Germany and Europe aimed to repair itself. And one of the big things I discovered is that when Adolf Hitler took office, what he aimed to do was he aimed to completely dismiss and deconstruct trust in government, science, and the media. That's exactly what is happening right now in the United States. So I think that our democratic process is at stake. Is at stake. And then after that, of course, I mean, when we start talking about Black lives, I mean, we're in the middle of a series of pandemics, not just COVID-19 and not just police brutality because Black people have been dealing with that for a long time, but a racial awakening around police brutality is part of the pandemic. That is part of the response that people are having. And then that's coupled with economic angst that we know that Blacks and Latinos are more likely to be frontline essential workers. We know that not only are Black people several times more likely to die due to police violence, but also several times more likely to die from COVID-19. So everything that's happening right now is colliding on Black people in a way that makes people very disenchanted with politics, very disenchanted with life. And it is a huge threat to our democracy and the democratic experiment. And, and Dr. Johnson, what's, what's at stake? Well, um, definitely uh, Captain Pruitt and, and Dr. Ray have covered a lot of what I would say, but I would say that what is really sticking out to me is the fact that we're at an interesting confluence of number, a number of things. Um, one, we have an awakening within the black and brown and, and indigenous communities around police brutality that we haven't experienced in, in, in quite a while, decades. At the same time, we also have an interesting uh, moment within um, what's going on within politics, the administration, Trump and his avowed dislike of cities, of, of everything that is African-American or black um, and also suggesting that somehow there are good people also on the other side of the white supremacists. Um, but also I wanna point out the good. You know, along with activists, we have now science that's actually showing the extent of, of the brutality, not just, you know, the video that's out there capturing a lot of these acts, but now we know because of people like Rashawn Ray and the work that we do at Washington University that these, there are disparities in police homicide according to race. There is very good evidence now about the fact that there, there may be differences among the police ranks in terms of their belief and mindset concerning race. So I think we have something there to build on and to bring about what I would call an evidence-based policy strategy. And then along with that, we have Black Lives Matter somewhat framing for us a lot of what we should be focused on. And we're gonna talk about hopefully defunding the police uh, versus some other um, uh, approach to police reform. Hopefully we'll talk about um, what's happening within uh, schools with school resource officers and the fact that Black Lives Matter is suggesting that we should end those contracts. So I think this is a great moment to shape policy because clearly we can't go back. We need to move forward. And we, I think we have all of the parts in place to build something that will bring about lasting and, and effective change. Well, well, let's jump to that. And you're absolutely right. So much of the public discourse around police reform or criminal justice reform has focused on brutality, death, killing, um, account and accountability. 
Um, so let's let's let we'll just start with you, Dr. Johnson. Let's jump let's jump into that, and then all of you, whoever, let's just have the conversation now. There is the discourse around defund, divest, reform, dissolve. You know, how are we framing? What? How would you address this issue? How do we talk about it? What specific policies uh, should we should we begin with? Well, you know, while I understand that there are many ways and, and many voices out there, the, the Black Lives Matter movement is a diverse one. And so in no way am I suggesting that what I believe uh, to be important about these particular policy approaches is what Black Lives Matter would have. But I do understand that defunding the police is different than dissolving the police, which also could be different than reforming the police. And the reason why I, I highlight those differences is because central to understanding and building a consensus around what is good for the Black community is understanding um, exactly what we mean by what we say. And in my case, from my perspective, I believe there's um, a, an opportunity for all three. And so when I say defund, for example, I'm one that would say, yes, we need to get rid of school resource officers or um, uh, trained law enforcement out of schools. So that could be part of the, the defunding uh, platform that we get rid of law enforcement within schools. But then also, I do believe that we have a cultural problem uh, happening in, in policing and I think when we are talking about policing as an identity and the cultures that have arisen within those agencies around those identities, it becomes very hard to argue that reform is a realistic option. I don't know if we can reform identities. And so I don't know that um, reform is the best way to address cultures. In that case, I do believe getting rid of officers, and if that means dissolving, but definitely getting rid of officers that are unfit for the job, and then also reform. I do think that there are practices and policies that have to be in place that would support a pro-policing culture. And when I say pro-policing culture, I mean one that builds on community policing as a model, one that believes in or supports community trust, one that believes in accountability and transparency. Because the only way that we are going to get to um, address many of these issues that are animating the Black Lives Movement is to actually have a healthy kind of policing. And that means that we need to address the concerns and needs of police agencies. And you, you raised identity and police identity, uh, policing as an identity. And I, I wanted to connect with, with Captain Pruitt about this. Um, this identity, this identity of a blue life, this identity um, that the mistrust around that. Can you speak to that, that? And particularly in some ways that Dr. Johnson was saying, part of the problem is this culture, this cultural identity uh, of policing. Yes. Um, so historically, uh, when policing came about in this informal way, it was created in order to control, to control basically black bodies. And in order to control those black bodies, and this is in the South, we won't even start on the North, but in, but in the South, you know, you have this, you had the slave patrols. And so they gathered up uh, willing people from the neighborhood. And, and those people were people who were not much better off than slaves themselves. And so now they had a, a come up. Oh, look, you know, I got a job, I got some money and I got a group of people that I can control because power, you know, the control part is very powerful and, you know, it, it draws you in. And so let's fast forward through all of the things that we've experienced as a people through slavery and reconstruction and Jim Crow and uh, the civil rights movement, the fake war on drugs. And here we are in 2020 and we're going through the things that we're going through now, which is just a different way or different, uh, uh, a different look from the look that we had when we were slaves. But that mindset, that traditional mindset has come forward as well. And it, again, when I say that it's deeply entrenched, it really, really is. Um, 
someone a little while ago just spoke about, um, well, I think it was Dr. J Dr. Uh, Johnson when we were talking about you know policing culture and, and then you asked me about being blue. And so as a response to Black Lives Matter, the police, and when I say the police, this is a generalization, this is not all police, of course, but the police are saying blue lives matter. And then they've gone a step further now and they are suffering from blue racism. I, and I, you know, I was, I was dumbfounded when I heard that. I'm like, well, since when did blue become a race? But you know, we know that race is a social construct, but we're not gonna get that deep unless one of the doctors wants to do that. But anyway, nobody's skin is blue when we're born. You know, we're, we're brown because this is how we are. This is the color of our skin, light brown, dark brown, in between. And so you're comparing you putting on a uniform to me wearing this skin, which is absolutely ridiculous to me. But every time we think that, you know, we, we found us something that we can hold on to, something that we can believe in, something that we can use to put forth our pain and our suffering and fight for equity, then there's always something else. And right now it's the blue racism. <laughs> and so when you talk about what are we gonna do about that, I know we're gonna go into more detail about that, but Dr. Johnson is right. I, you know, I'm in some circles where they're talking about completely abolishing the police and just starting all over again and making it in a way that is palatable to everyone, that everyone can stand behind because they'll have equity and justice and the things that the people want to see. Because right now, that is why we have these uprisings because people are just not happy anymore. And law enforcement is, should be created for the people. So why not let the people create it? Absolutely. Dr. Ray, I see you're nodding and I know you want in on this, please. I mean, I'm, I'm just a, I'm just a, a great, an observer right now, listening wow. to greatness with what the, with what they're saying. I mean, from saying that police officers are suffering from blue racism is so profound. Hearing Dr. Johnson say, "I don't know if we can reform identities." I mean, those two comments get at the core of what people are saying. That when it comes to reform, and you know, in the spaces I work in, that's how, that's one of the ways that I think. And I always tell people, because I get that question that Dr. Johnson broke down so, so well, is when we start talking about abolition, when we start talking about defunding, when we start talking about reform, these all mean slightly different things. Um, and they can at times mean different things to different people. And the way I think about it is, if we really want to do something about it, when we talk about bad apples, bad apples come from somewhere. And oftentimes those bad apples come from rotten trees. And if you have a rotten tree, you know, as Captain Pruitt was saying, you can't just spray weed killer on it. If anybody has a garden, like they're gonna come up every single year. They're just gonna come back and overtake your garden in your yard. You literally have to dig up, the, you literally have to dig up the roots and plant anew. And if we are talking about abolishing and reimagining, which I think is just a nice way of saying abolishing in a sense to some people. But if we do talk about reform, I think there are some things we can think about. On the defund the police front, there are real valid reasons to do so, and I've, I've written about it. Um, Dr. Johnson talked about an evidence-based approach. When you take an evidence-based market-driven approach to law enforcement, what you find is that in most major cities across the United States, Baltimore being one, but there are many, from Minneapolis to LA to Oakland even, spending over 40% on law enforcement from their general budget, then most major cities spend about 33% that's every one out of $3 from the general fund. So for people who pay taxes, you need to think that one out of every three of your tax money is going to law enforcement. And then you need to ask yourself, are you getting that rate of return? Part of what we know is that when it comes to calls for service, nine out of 10 of them have nothing to do with violence at all. Doesn't mean they can't turn violent, but nine out of 10 have nothing to do with violence at all. We also know that in black and brown communities, that police officers uh, oftentimes respond slower and ambulatory services respond slower when they actually need someone to come. So when people hear the narrative from black people, when black people in local communities, particularly low income, high crime communities, and they say, we want more police, really what they're saying is we want more safety. We want safety just like the predominantly white neighborhood that's down the street. We want them to respond to us when our grandparents and our uncle or our aunts have a heart attack. 
or have a diabetes shock. We want them to respond to that. So defunding is something that people are saying, we want to reinvest, as I've heard Congressman Bass say, we wanna see people reinvest in local communities to shift and reallocate some of that money away from law enforcement to mental health facilities, to social services, to education. And then one of the big things that I'm big on as well is thinking about how abhorrent the violent crime clearance rate is. The violent crime clearance rate, I mean, 40% of homicides go unsolved every single year. And it's not because somebody in a local neighborhood wasn't snitching. That's not what it is. It's literally because police officers oftentimes have so many things on them that they are tasked with doing. And Captain Pruitt can talk about this. Like police officers are expected to do so many things from going around seeing if there's a pothole in the street to responding to something that has nothing to really do with, do with their job description. And police will tell you, they'll say, I don't, even, I don't even know why we're responding to these kind of calls. Instead, we should have the resources and be able to focus on more violent crimes so that we can get the violent crime uh, clearance rate up. And it's important to note, we're talking about 40% of homicides go unsolved, about 70% of um, robberies and about 50% of aggravated assaults and 66% of rapes. And it's not because all police aren't good at their job. It's because they are oftentimes worried about being on patrol, worried about traffic stops, worried about trying to make money for the municipality when it comes to traffic violations instead of solving crime. And then the main thing, the main two things I'll say on this front is I think the main shift that could happen when it comes to reform is shifting civilian payouts for police misconduct. Civilian payouts for police misconduct. I just, I just mentioned that you have a police budget, 30 to 40% in most places. When there is a, an incident, like what happened with Breonna Taylor, a family got awarded, what was it, 12 million, 14 million, 12. That money did not come from, from the police budget. That money then came from the general funds in the city of Louisville. Now, imagine if we make that shift to police department insurance policies. This money should not be coming out of taxpayers' pockets. When you shift it to police department insurance policies, what happens at that point is you have a police chief, like in Minneapolis, who can say, Derek Chauvin, over the past five years, you've cost us $10 million. Our premium has increased. And, and, I, and I still think the municipality should pay for, for the insurance policy. But, but that money should come from the police department budget, not the general funds. So then they can go to Chauvin and say, you've been costing us too much money. We can no longer afford to keep you because we've been spending so much money. And how much money are we talking about? Well, in the city of Chicago, I mean, they've spent millions and millions of dollars like $700 million, in fact, over the past two decades on the civilian payouts. So imagine if that money went to the west and south sides of Chicago. People always like to highlight Chicago. It's like, oh, look at all the bad things happening in Chicago with crime. I went to school, grad school in Indiana. Dr. Johnson is from the Midwest. We know Chicago very, very well. And part of knowing that is the lack of resources those particular neighborhoods have. So I think shift, making that shift will lead to a different accountability structure and start to transform the identities that officers have. Because right now they don't have any accountability. Like they don't have any accountability to the public. Now they have accountability to each other. And that's a big thing we could talk about internally, but that doesn't mean they have external accountability. Well, well Captain Pro, I do wanna talk about that and the connection to that, that identity, that blueness, that uniform, and also in the context of not just the FOP and police unions, but police unions in general, and some of the some of the, the challenges around around that, around moving forward. You mentioned it a little earlier in some of your comments about internally within the departments, within the the heads, that there's resistance. Can you can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah. Um, so you mentioned unions, and I think that unions are absolutely a great idea, as long as they work within the scope for which they were created. And that is to uh, ensure great working conditions for police officers. Uh, we find many times that unions work outside of their scope and they, they have become very politically involved, for instance. And while you may be, um, your, your, not, your not-for-profit status may allow you to endorse a, a, a candidate, the thought for me is, but should you? 
I mean, are we here to divide our troops? Or are we here to support that they have great working conditions? That, to me, that's the, you know, the bottom line. You, that's what you should be doing. And so they become very political and very strong. Um, and so their influence is great amongst in, in politics and in, you know, in government. And so it's really hard to fight against that. Someone uh, asked a question about the Law Enforcement Bill of Rights in the chat. And that document was created to ensure that police officers had due process, although I don't know what should be different from the, you know, having being a regular citizen and having due process, but nevertheless, in the 70s, it was created. And so now we're taking a look at that because that also is an issue. If you give someone enough room, they're going to fill that room up. I like what Dr. Ray uh, talked about with money, for instance, and I know I'm jumping around a bit, but I, I have so many <laughs> thoughts in my head surrounding this question. If you attach money to performance, which we do all the time in the public and private sector, then you might see some behaviors change. So if you attach the department's money to how police commissioners and police chiefs respond to these needs for police reform, then you might actually see some change. How would you do that? Well, that would be up to state legislators and maybe even the federal government, okay? But when follow the money. My, I tell my students all the time, if you're looking for where the problem is, look at the money. And I like your idea, Dr. Ray, I'm going to steal that the next time I have a conversation about the money. Um, <laughs> so this blue thing, um, this, this it's, it, it is an actual culture. I liken it to a gang or to the mafia. Mm. It creates a family. <laughs> look at Dr. Johnson, he's ready. It <laughs> creates a a, 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 you know, they call it a brotherhood and a sisterhood. It is not actually that. It is a method, method of control mm -hmm. and it works perfectly. It works exactly how it was created to work, to have power and control. And really, and I'll end with this, let Dr. Johnson speak. One of the scariest things about this, this fraternity is that now we're finding, just like back in the 60s and the 50s and the 40s and the 30s and 20s, we're finding that police officers are involved in white nationalist activity. And police departments know it. They know that their officers are online, they've joined these groups. And so now you take that activity and you, and you pair it with this blue culture and this power inequity and please someone tell me, make it make sense how that could ever possibly work out for everyone and that everyone in this country could feel safe, especially black and brown people. Absolutely, and Dr. Johnson, and, and we're, not, we're not going away from Dr. Ray's and, and I agree, you follow the money, but again, in terms of making real reform and this, this identity and this culture and you're nodding, you know that 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 is something that is a, a real challenge and must be must be addressed. So um, we, I'd love your feedback on this. So I'm I'm so happy that we're having this conversation because I want to say that this should be priority one, and I'm I'm just going to kind of give an analogy and maybe this will kind of drive home how important this is. So you know many of us are affiliated with fraternities and sororities. And we agree that we're AKAs, Alphas, Sigmas, Deltas, after taking off the Perry, the letters. Um, the problem arises when your identity stops you from reporting other members of your organization that have broken the organization's rules or the law by hazing potential members. So likewise, when the Blue Lives identity leads officers to protect their fellow officers from responsibility for their misdeeds, even when what is at stake is another life, black lives, then the identity becomes problematic because it is protecting behavior that undermines the foundation of the profession, including community trust, integrity, and accountability. Uh, not, not only that though, the, the very slogan then becomes proof that dissolving the police is really the only way because reforming identities is much more difficult than reforming practices and policies. So 
identity is what has turned many of these police agencies into frat brothers with guns. So how do you move forward? And I've been advocating that at this point, there should be uh, a nationwide, of course, it's not gonna come from BAR. BAR is not gonna direct all these agencies to, to do this, but nonetheless, it needs to be said. We need to do background checks on all of the officers now and have that informed review of their actual police records. That's something that has happened in, in St. Louis. And because of that, the county, uh, the, the city prosecutor has declined to take cases from about 17 officers because she has found that their integrity is compromised. That's the first thing. The second thing we need to do is to have periodic review of all officers. I would say every three years, there should be another background inquiry to make sure that they haven't said something on social media or acted in a way that does not comport with the execution of their sworn duties. So these are just a few things that we can do, but I want to stress that we are not going to change this problem if we don't get rid of some police officers. They are unfit and that's the only way that you're gonna bring about a cultural change because this identity issue is a big issue. And, and, and Dr. Ray, there, there is so much of the premise, we start these conversations that there's mistrust on both sides, uh, the black and brown communities and police officers. And what is often omitted of this is that sometimes in each group, whether it's in a relationship or marriage or work, the individuals have to do their own work. Uh, and so it sounds like we're talking about the work that needs to happen within law enforcement agencies in order to be, even begin to develop community trust. Is that, what, is that what I'm hearing? You know, I always find the comment um, that there's a lack of trust on both sides to be an oxymoron because how can you have a lack of trust on both sides when there's clearly one side doing the brutalizing and clearly one side is being victimized, but supposedly there's a lack of trust on both sides. I've always found that fascinating. And part of what I think it is, is that for a large segment of police officers, and I think we're highlighting this in terms of how we talk about identity and culture, is that for a large number of police officers, they don't really experience the communities that they serve in. Like they don't experience them at all. See, when we talk about community policing, community policing isn't just playing basketball or football with some kids in the local community. It's experiencing it. It is living there. It's going to school there, it's sending your kids to school there. It's shopping there, going to restaurants, going to houses of worship. You know, that happens in predominantly white neighborhoods, which is why they don't have a trust issue. So when they talk about a lack of trust between community and police, that's not really what they're, they're meaning. They're saying it's a lack of trust between police and low income, primarily black and brown communities. That's really what they're talking about. And that's because oftentimes when the police come there, they come there for a reason to do something to people. They just don't go there to experience it, which is why one of the big things I think that needs to happen is that it needs to be mandated that police officers live within um, the geographic boundaries of the municipality or within a certain number of miles within that municipality. So in the state of Maryland, maybe that gives people a little leeway to be outside of a county, but you shouldn't be living an hour away from where you are purposefully because when you're a police officer, and this gets back to the differences between a racial identity and a worker role, which is what we're talking about, the difference between being black and the difference between being a police officer. Police officers can choose what they do. If they don't want to live in a play, in an area that is mandated that you're supposed to live there, well, go do another profession. You, you have a choice to do that. People don't have a choice whether or not they want to be Black or Latino. And I think the other reason why I think that's important is because some of the research that we've done highlights that police officers are also overstressed and overworked. And part of what contributes to that is their commute. Part of what contributes to that is their work hours. Part of what also contributes to that is them trying to make ends meet. In most metropolitan areas, police officers cannot afford to live there. So even the ones who want to live there, they can't. And so I think if, if, if certain places make it mandatory for police officers to live in a place, there should also be a housing subsidy attached to that.
Now, for some people who say, well, how can you support defund the police and also say something like that? Well, I think there are various ways, as Dr. Johnson was saying, in terms of how we think about budgets. It's about reallocating, but I think it's also about shifting. And part of thinking about shifting is thinking about housing for officers. It's also thinking about mental health for officers. I mean, if we wanna help change culture and their identities, I mean, there's a, a data set that I have that I think Dr. Johnson would love to uh, go through. So we'll have to talk about that. That shows that about 80% of officers suffer from chronic stress, depression, anxiety, anger issues, um, issues at, at home with their family. And that's because they see things and experience things that they cannot really talk about to a whole lot of people. And they're supposed to be stoic. Part of having this police identity, this blue identity, is that supposedly you become like a robot, like you can just take it all, but they can't. And so then what happens is that not only is it 80% of them suffer from chronic stress, 90% of them never seek help. 90% of them never seek help. But they also need to make sure that, we, that they have mandatory mental health counseling. The same way that as Dr. Johnson is saying that their records are reviewed every few years, every quarter, so four times a year, police officers need to choose who they wanna go to see, they need to go to get counseling, and that needs to become normalized. Because I mean, there are just a series of problems within that because we know, one thing we know about implicit bias and even explicit bias is that Implicit bias goes on steroids when people don't have a lot of information, when they're stressed, and when they have to make quick decisions. And police officers have to do that every single day. And so there are things that we can do to really change this if we want. We just haven't had the willpower to do it. Thank you, Dr. Uh, Captain Pruitt. I don't even need to give you a lead in, just jump. <laughs> No, I'm tired of following Dr. Ray around these uh, these forums, but I actually love him. Oh my God. So um, he hit on something that I want to speak to, and that is, where do you live when you're a police officer? Um, there used to be a time when I thought that you don't have to necessarily live close to where you work as an officer in order to embrace the community. Perhaps the fallacy there was that that was because I was living close to where I worked. I, I didn't live in Montgomery County. I live in Prince George's County, but I live right on the line. So I still experience the, the county. I, st I was still experiencing the county that I worked in. But here's the important thing that it occurs to me that yes, it was intentional that officers would go and live in Damascus and Frederick they didn't come and live down south like the black officers. That's where all the black officers from Montgomery County were living. When I say all, not all, but you know, many of us were living in Silver Spring and Burtonsville and in, in Prince George's County. So we were having a different experience of our community. But here is the thing. When you live that far away from people, that the people that you police or that you are supposed to serve, I don't like using policing, but the people that you're supposed to serve, you get to avoid the one thing that I feel is really, really important in these police encounters where black people are ending up dead. And that is you lose a connection with those people's humanity. You don't have to see them as your neighbors. You don't have to see them as your family, as you see your family, as your brother and sister, your father and your mother. They're just some folks who live down the way. And I contend that when we have these uh, shootings where people, where people are, are, are dying at the hands of police officers and they're unarmed and their backs are turned, it's because those officers do not see them as the human beings that they are or that the people that they love are. We're not even trained to see, uh, as law enforcement, we're not even trained to see uh, everybody else as someone who's, who's worthy of going home. We're trained to make sure that the police go home. That is, that is at the forefront. You get to go home. I don't care what it is you have to do, but the conversation is not that whoever you come into contact with, whatever happens, you try your best to make sure everybody goes home. And that is what's missing for me. Yeah, thank you for that. And, and this is a good transition 
to our opening up to our, our Q and A, because I, I do know the, the four of us, the three of us could continue on and on, and maybe we'll get to do this again. Um, but I definitely want to jump to what, and I think uh, it was actually a comment in the chat. Uh, and then Eva, I'll go to, I'll go to you, because I know you all have some questions that are, that are coming from Facebook, et cetera. But um, I think this is a nice um, thing to sort of ask. Um, um, Lester is saying, uh, to what extent is the image of Black people within the public's imagination being used to justify a perpetual state of emergency? in order to expand the powers of this law of law and order, whether it's a law and order president or a law and order. So whoever would like to talk about the, the, the image and to what extent it's, you know, I, yeah, I Dr. Johnson. That, um, just because it's, it's not something that is, is uh, new. It's not something that has been done only by this president. Um, unfortunately, Democrats and Republicans going way back decades, um, the Congressional Black Caucus was in support of legislation that I believe led to the criminalization, especially of young kids within schools, zero tolerance policies, drug free school zones act, all of these things that ratcheted up the sanctions for drug possession, while over the last two decades, we've actually seen a precipitous decline on al almost all indicators of violence, whether it's uh, threats against teachers, homicides within schools, or victimization rates, had all declined over the past two decades. But it was the sensational school shooter that led policymakers to pile on more police officers, more metal detectors, to militarize our um, um, schools, to make them something other than places of warmth where you can experience attachment and belongingness. Mm -hmm. So I don't know that this is a strategy just of Trump. I think we have had inordinate responses to what we perceive to be um, crises of crime. And really it's because of the political rhetoric that sensationalizes what happens in black and brown communities as if there's something seriously wrong there that only, you know, if corrected, could get this person in office. And I think that's been one of the problems that we're, we've always had and are continuing to see under the present administration. Well, and it's a, a, it's a founding, um, you know, um, depend, I mean, there's been some controversy, but sort of the stamped from the beginning. I mean, this is always a black and brown bodies of always being used from the beginning. And I guess uh, uh, Captain Pruitt brought it early on talking about the original formation of our, of our police department and its, per and its purpose. But again, the, the, the black body and the imagination of always being something to be feared is something you're absolutely right. It didn't just start with Trump. It's just being um, uh, reutilized again and again. Uh, Dr. Ray. Yeah, I mean, I, I mean, I completely agree with Dr. Johnson. I mean, I, I think that the broader narrative about law and order doesn't really match exactly what's going on. So as an example, um, Trump has a commercial that's particularly in battleground states. So people in Maryland might've not seen it as much, but it, it's essentially a commercial that, that says that if, um, that if Biden wins, then we're gonna continue to see cities burn. And the ironic thing is that those are clips from a Trump administration. Yes. And I think those are the sort of things that uh, that's difficult for people to weed through. The other thing corresponding the law and order rhetoric on uh, cable news, because it primarily comes from Twitter for Trump, but broadly on social media. I mean, it's, ta it's targeting Black people, Latino people, as well as suburban families who are mostly white in slightly different ways trying to make them do different things. And, you know, part of this, we have to be very realistic about the fact that one out of six college educated black men voted for Donald Trump in 20, in 2016. One out of six. There are some people who think they might go up. Some people think they might go down. I, I'm still kind of trying to figure it out. I think it might honestly be, be a similar percentage. But the point is that is how do we kind of rationalize that particular outcome? And I mean, there are various ways we can do it, but one of the main ways I interpret it 
is that the messaging that is being sent to different populations is focused on the way in which they engage in social media, that their social media algorithm triggers levels of distrust and has a perception that in this regard that Trump and Biden um, are one and the same. When, when you not only look at their record, but you also look at their rhetoric and how they behave, they are drastically different people. And it's very clear that one will lead us to a path of more equality and the other one will drive us down a road where the democratic experiment might be over. Absolutely. Um, so do we have some questions from our, Eva, do you have some? Um... Yes, we do. Um, so first question here uh, from um, Reverend Dr. Paula Bowling is how can you guarantee there will be transparency in the police department? Well, as someone who was in a police department, uh, Captain, and maybe you could, again, take the, you feel free to take any part of that question and turn it into what you need it to be. <laughs> we all learned that in graduate school, right? <laughs> so answer the question. Oh my gosh. Again, I, you know, I'm going to reiterate the need to hold police leadership accountable. Right now, um, you can become a police chief or commissioner and make hundreds of thousands of dollars and be very, very comfortable. You can be very comfortable within your police department and comfortable politically. And if we look around, look around the country to see what's been happening lately, you don't even have to perform well. You can just be sitting up in there making lots of money. Um, there is a, an organization that uh, participates in, in police chief searches to help the police, the, the county or the, the jurisdiction, the locality, the government, find police chiefs. So they just recycle the same people over and over. I won't say who that is right now, but they just recycle the same people over and over. And so you take a police chief out of a high paying job here, send them to, to Chicago or Dallas or Houston or wherever you need a new police chief. In the meantime, people are suffering. So I contend and I will keep saying, when you make, when you hold police chiefs and commissioners accountable, when you hold accountable county executives and county councils and mayors who, who, who choose these chiefs of police and commissioners, when you hold your, uh, when you vote for a sheriff that's going to uh, mirror your ideal deals in, in how they manage their sheriff's department, then we can see some change. And I do think if you tie money to not only the police department, but to the salaries of the people who are sitting in these seats, then we might see some change. In addition, I agree with Dr. Johnson. It is going to be very, very difficult to change mindsets. People are stuck where they are in policing. That is why you, it's so polarized. For a second after George Floyd's murder, you saw people's fist up in the air. I'm sorry, police officers fist up in the air and they were kneeling. And then about two weeks later, they stopped that stuff because some of the unions even threatened their members. Oh, you better get up off your knees. And they got up off their knees. So <laughs> the culture is deeply entrenched. And we need to think about, like Dr. Johnson says, how are we going to get rid of some of those officers? And in addition, when they're coming through the door, how are we going to assess them so that we choose the right people for the job? And we, I have some ideas about that, but I'm not going to go on and on right now. And to Dr. Ray's point, to also make sure, uh, focus on the public health uh, you know, of these police officers and their fitness to serve. So those that are work good and should serve can serve uh, and not experience the, the suicide rates, the domestic violence rates, the drug addiction rates that we, we know is, is really going on in our communities. Um, another question. Yes. Uh, this question is, uh, was directed to Dr. Johnson, but I, I, I think the other panelists uh, can definitely chime in if they like. Um, what do you say about the concerns that community policing in Camden, New Jersey, increased surveillance of black and brown communities, still reinforcing unjust imprisonment? And this came from Kara Morello. I definitely agree with that. Um, surveillance, especially of the sort that is um, driven by law enforcement or at least informs law enforcement is on the rise everywhere. It's not just Camden, New Jersey. And um, one of the capacities I have at WashU is of the director of the, uh, the um, uh, Institute in Critical Quantitative Computational Mixed Methods. And what we're really interested in is how these innovations in STEM and technology 
are actually increasing the surveillance capacity of police agencies, how AI and facial recognition programs are misrecognizing with some degree of frequency people of color, and also the fact that school systems are now rolling out these surveillance uh, platforms within their schools. So yes, we are in a, a, another moment that I, I think many of us have failed to fully recognize, and that is that the edifice of, of a different form of surveillance and policing is really unfolding. And it's, the, it's in the computational front lines now that we, we should be battling to make sure that we can uh, be ensured of procedural justice. Just frequently, uh, recently, we, we found that um, uh, police officers in, in Tampa were uh, carrying out an algorithm in order to predict who might commit crimes and then was harassing those <laughs> individuals. So again, it's a new frontier in our battle for racial and social justice this whole computational environment and the way in which it's creating another layer of inequality and injustice for people of color. Dr. Do Johnson, uh, what you're talking about is the reality of the minority report. So if, if those, if using the words computational algorithm, et cetera, is it, <laughs> could you say a little more, could, could you bring it, could you bring it to there for those of us, for those of us uh, Okay, well, if you haven't seen Minority Report, it's this, this uh, movie with Tom Cruise. Basically, uh, there are individuals that are gifted with uh, precog, which basically is this ability to predict the occurrence of crime. So they're actually arresting people before the crime is committed in order to preclude the crime. But, you know, we are not gifted with that type of brain yet. So instead, we create these programs that then feed into algorithms, basically not only um, you know, the socioeconomic status, the racial background, your zip code of residence, um, but they also link it to police data and um, pictures of, of um, um, mugshots and, and so forth. And they use all of this data to basically suggest that certain people should be targeted as suspicious before they even exhibit any other criminal activity. So this is what's happened in Tampa. It's what's being rolled out everywhere. And facial recognition programs, I'm a, they are already within certain school systems. So um, we should be concerned about that because federal reports have shown that facial recognition programs misidentify um, uh, people of color with significant differences, all right? Significantly more likely to identify them or misidentify them. Um, and so I think, like I said, that's the next frontier. And we're behind schedule already on fighting that because we need to be prepared um, and producing people within the field, which happens to be one of the least diverse within all uh, categories of labor. So which this is, I want to say, where you should be focusing going forward. So which field is that? And because what raises, and it may be Dr. Ray and Prua can say as well, as I think about the one a question that we got earlier was about the use of body cameras and this collecting more data and information. So how does something that is being proposed as a solution, as a remedy, as 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 a way to uh, catch folks in the act or for diversion, could that data and information be used to actually feed this this practice of, so, of marketing on steroids, of uh, um, racial profiling on steroids, essentially? Well, in the fatal interactions with police study, we do include within our modeling the use of body cameras. Um, actually, let me rephrase, the presence of body cameras. Okay. So the problem here is that the presence of body cameras does not always indicate their use. For instance, police officers can turn on or off those body cameras at times. And then a step further, if we then collect the data, let's say the body camera was on, then there needs to be review of the footage 
And oftentimes, and you know, if the camera's on quite a bit, if they're on patrol, not all of that footage is reviewed. And then a step further than that is if it is reviewed and there's something objectionable found, there has to be a sergeant or an officer or a captain or someone that's willing to say, this is unacceptable, let's move this toward review and investigation. So the presence of the camera is not all that we need. It has to be on, the footage needs to be reviewed, and then there needs to be sanctions attached to what is found. And that requires culture. We need a cultural shift within these organizations that believe that these technologies are important and that what is viewed should inform how, uh, whether these officers stay employed or not. But so I just, I guess I wanted to ask Dr. Ray about the sort of this, this concern, and you're right, this is not, this does not come up what you raise about the ability to profile, but using objective measures, using science, all right, using data and information uh, to profile communities and, 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 you know, you don't put them in jail uh, prior to them committing the crime as they do in the film, but you are doing over surveillance and, and observing them. Um, Dr. Ray, are you, are you, do you share those concerns or do you have some comments on that? Yeah, most definitely. I mean, I agree with everything that Dr. Johnson just said. And um, I wrote a, an article, I think it was earlier this year at Brookings, about five questions that policymakers should ask about AI bias in law enforcement around facial recognition. And I mean, to Dr. Johnson's point, that's already happening. Like Minority Report is, is here in terms of police officers are going out rounding people up. We also know these algorithms are also used to determine who should get cash bail or not, who should come up for parole or not. We also know that they're being used, maybe being you been being used for years at our airports. But one of the other, the, the problem with it is that the algorithms have a lot of bias embedded yes. with them for a couple of main reasons. I mean, there are several, but I'll just highlight a couple. One big one is because um, there's a perception that technology is bias free. Yes. Who do we think creates the technology? It's people who have biases who are oftentimes in Silicon Valley and Silicon Valley doesn't look like this panel in one way, shape, form or the other. So they're making decisions about people and they're oftentimes when it comes to facial recognition, taking people's faces from databases and entering them into an algorithm that continuously runs. And I know this, I know the algorithm space in um, policing very well because we have an algorithm that we use for our virtual reality program. And the only way you can prime it is if you have racially diverse faces and you have faces across various sexual orientations, even just beyond people who identify as being a man or a woman. And so there are a lot of limitations embedded with that. So part of what that means then is when you try to figure out if someone's face matches something else you've seen, the algorithm gets it wrong. How wrong does it get it? Well, take um, Amazon's program, all right? Amazon's program is supposed to be the wave of the future. They pulled it recently because of criticisms that it was wrong. And I think Amazon is gonna hopefully get this right. They were saying, look, all right, legislation hasn't told us we can't use this. Law enforcement wants to use it. We're gonna do the right thing and pull it back. But why is this important? Two main reasons. First, there are studies that show that black people's faces are misclassified. Black people are more likely to be framed as being criminals, in particular, black women's faces. About half of the time, black women, uh, potentially oftentimes because of different hairstyles, the algorithm isn't advanced enough. The facial recognition algorithm isn't advanced enough to pick up on them. The second thing that happens is that there was a study that, that used uh, Boston professional athletes, so for the, um, the New England Patriots, the Red Sox, and the Celtics, and then they, a study also used California state legislatures. And in half of the time, they framed those legislators and those professional athletes as being criminals, even though they weren't. Like it was picking them up as being different people. Mm -hmm. Part of why this is important is because the legislation is so far behind on this that what tech companies do is they come in and they say, we're going to pay your police department $100,000. We're going to pay your police department $20,000 to use our technology. And then you look in Tampa, they start deploying this technology when it's supposed to be a pilot but they're using it to make real life decisions about people's lives that is, in, that is baked with bias. 
look, we only have a few more minutes. So, uh, but thank you so much. Uh, could you just each one, just a round robin, just give, give us 60 seconds of next steps. Um, I know we'll continue this conversation, um, but uh, could you do that, um, please? Let's just uh, start with Dr. Johnson. Next steps, vote. Yeah, or final vote. comments, cookies, yeah. Vote. Vote. And vote. Get more vote. people to vote. Yes. Um, make sure people are registered to vote. Those deadlines are coming up if they haven't passed in certain states. Get your ballot in early. Um, everything that you can do to assure, ensure that you're counted is really fundamental to every issue that we have discussed on this panel. It's just clear that one of the moments, um, I, I want to say um, aspects of this defining moment is that we are undergoing this, this population shift and a backlash or fear to the coming reality. And so this new demographic reality in the United States can only be effective if we all are voting, right? It doesn't make a difference how numerous Latinx population is or how many African Americans there are. If we are not exercising our vote, then we're not going to do anything to change the, you know, be the change, right? So vote. Thank you, Dr. Ray. I, I mean, I echo everything that Dr. Johnson said. I, I'll just try to build on it. I think that what people don't realize about this particular election is that um, the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, which the House of Representatives passed symbolically on Tamir Rice's 18th birthday, if Joe Biden wins and the Senate flips probably about four votes, but definitely six, um, all of a sudden that legislation becomes law. And that is one of the most transformative uh, policing legislations that we've ever had. A lot of the things that we talked about will be covered in that. This is also important because people need to recognize that the lasting legacy of Donald Trump, even though we'll remember what he says, where it's gonna impact people is when they have any sort of interaction with the courts. He has put more federal judges on the courts than basically any other president in human history. And that's partly because President Obama had more federal judges blocked than all previous presidents combined. That is the legacy of Donald Trump and Mitch McConnell. And when it comes to thinking about voting, it's not just voting in the presidential, presidential election, it's down ballot as well. Down ballots matter. Pay attention to your state Senate, your state Senate races, your state, de your, your state delegate races, your local races, because the big, one of the other big changes that needs to make um, in order to increase accountability is we need to ensure that police officer, I mean, we need to ensure that civilians are on police officer trial boards. These are the internal misconduct um, juries, essentially, that law enforcement serves on. And oftentimes police officers, I mean, um, the public are not part of that. So when you have a police chief say, yeah, sure, you can create a civilian review board. That's because they realize that review board is just symbolic. It actually has no power. If you wanna know a model, Look at the community oversight board ran by Jill Verge in Nashville. That is a community oversight board that has power and they did that primarily through voting and advocacy. Thank you. And Captain Pruitt, can you close us out? Yeah, so that voting thing is really important. As I said earlier, uh, vote, votes, uh, your, your, your conscious, but also vote so that you can have effective police leadership however that looks, whether it's your mayor or your county exec. But I also want to challenge the public. Look, this is all in our hands as the public, okay? Uh, in our voting, but consider these things. I would, I would challenge you to learn some history. Learn about how slave patrols came about. Learn about what happened in the North when they began to form their formal police departments. And those were based on, uh, their personnel were based on some discrimination against immigrants. I mean, it's really deeper than just surface. And so do your homework so that you, when you go to the polls, you can be empowered with knowledge. Um, second, 
educate yourself about your rights. It's easy for us to be on a traffic stop talking about we know our rights when we really don't know the Fourth Amendment. It is really not difficult. And if you want me to come out and give you a class or you want to come sit in my class, come on and we will talk about the Fourth Amendment because it is extremely important that you are empowered with that information too so that you won't panic when you come into contact with the police that you'll have the knowledge to get you through the situation. And then if you need to file a complaint, you can do that. But I will echo my brother's Vote, 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 because our lives do depend on it. Thank you. Thank you. This has just been so powerful, so informative. See what great educators we have uh, in Maryland, in our country. Uh, everything you've said has just been right on target. Um, Chairwoman, I think this is just, it just keeps getting better and better. Uh, I will echo vote, but also fill out the census, call the census. Uh, September 30th is the last day. Uh, they had extended it to October, but then he moved it back. Um, we must make sure that everybody is counted and send back that, that absentee ballot. Uh, so again, honored to do this. Thank you, Chairwoman. Thank you all so much. You know, I expected this to be a rich conversation. I did. I had no idea. And some conversations are so poignant that they just need to be reflected on. And I'm not going to talk because I want everyone to just internalize and process every single thing that they've heard tonight. I think this has been a conversation that we needed to have. I encourage everyone, this will be shown again on our Facebook page. I encourage everyone to go back and look at it again and really listen with your hearts this time. Listen with your hearts to what every one of these magnificent panelists have said. And I will just echo that nothing changes unless we vote. Thank you all so, so very much. I am so moved by tonight because I think it was absolutely powerful. We will see you all again next month. We will back, be back again um, with another uh, conversation and we thank you all for joining us tonight. Thank you very much. Thank you. Goodbye.